Welcome to the Climate Buzz podcast. The Climate Buzz is hosted by Dr. Bob Hanna, Kelly Sheehan, and Brad Rouse. Each week we share with you the stories, the people, the science, the challenges, and the solutions of a warming planet. We invite you to like and follow our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages, where we promise to keep you up on all the latest Climate Buzz and share the links, information, and footage discussed on the show. The Climate Buzz originally aired live on Asheville FM, a nonprofit, volunteer-powered community radio station based in Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville FM is dedicated to producing diverse and eclectic programming that inspires our listeners to build connections across communities and to discover new music and ideas. The Climate Buzz airs live on Mondays, 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, It can be heard locally on 103.3 FM and streamed and archived at www.ashevillefm.org. Today's show first aired live on May 29, 2023 on Asheville FM with Dr. Bob Hanna and Brad Rouse and guest Harper Robinson with Conservation Pros. Enjoy. Well, look who we have back in hey the studio today. It is Mr. Brad Roush. Yeah, Buenos Dias. <laughs> <laughs> Muy bien. Yeah. My Good goodness. Day day day. How long has it been? How long was that I journey was, uh, for you? I was uh, about a month. It's been a month. Mm-hmm. So, uh, maybe even a little bit more, but uh, quite an experience. Uh, quite a, you know, Travel is broadening, and I think uh, you know, I had my eyes opened a little bit, and now I'm still sort of... We got back in late last night, so it's still, you know, it's mid afternoon for me right now. So I am so impressed you are here because I'm going to say he's got to be just exhausted to to fly all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and then um, be here this morning flying to do the show. It, it, flying is easy. <laughs> flying is easy. It was an amazing conversation with a yeah. young quantum physicist next to me on the plane <laughs> yesterday who was. St- Doing our postdoctoral work at MIT, uh, so we you can believe we talked about oh, sci-fi I bet you and a lot of other talk stuff. About, huh? yeah, we did, we did. Well, bef- we did. I want to hear a little bit more about your um, European travels, but before we do, I wanted to um, to welcome um, Harper Robinson to um, the Climate Buzz today. And Harper's the owner of Conservation Pros, a, a group of building professionals with a modern and localized approach to indoor health, comfort, safety, and energy efficiency. Their goal is to improve our homes and quality of life with weatherization via improving home comfort, air quality, and efficiency. Harper, welcome to the hey, Climate Buzz. Thanks for having me, Bob. I'm a big fan of the of the station and community radio just glad to be here today yeah we're so excited to have you here and yeah. um, brad I, I wanted to say you know um you know in getting how long spend- do we have how long do we have i Bob? know <laughs> i know we'll see what we can do here we got a lot we got a lot on the show today but you know you got to spend a whole month in, in, over in um, yeah spain and portugal and so I'm curious, you know, what what kind of really jumped out at you in in, in as far as you know, green living over there, yeah, efficiency, so, just you know, what it was. so many, yeah. so many things. Um, it's a stark contrast, and and I, I will say first, it was a stark contrast coming back into Asheville last night, and just feeling the greenness of of our landscape and after these rains that we've had yeah. how we're the earth lungs to some extent uh, right here that it that it's dry over there yeah well uh, it was last summer right where they had the extreme r- weather right events. and then they had the extreme you know it's and it's and it's climate weirding because they said they were really 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 worried because they had had such a hot april and then may was like cool when we you know we i was wearing uh a, you know a hoodie and my sweatshirt my springsteen sweatshirt <laughs> for a lot of the time while i was over there you know so so it mm-hmm. was um, it was uh, not as warm as you would normally, and that, of course that's why we chose. We knew the heat was bad. We sh- we decided to go in May uh, as as maybe the best month to travel over there. But it, it was dry. It was good. They were getting some rain. They were happy to be getting some rain. Um, that that there were seemed to be a great concern. And you know we had a for two two weeks we were there. We had a tour and we had mm-hmm. tour guides. And the guides mentioned climate change and the impact and the impact it was having. We looked at the agriculture and some of the things that were happening. Um, so, uh, you know, they're feeling the effects and they're very aware of what's going on in Spain and Portugal. Uh, I think that's that's one of my yeah. my conclusions. Um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, another big conclusion was. 
And, and I think the best example of this is Madrid. I mean, Madrid is just incredible. They have this one square called Puerta del Sol, which is the, if people have been to Madrid, they will know about it. It's sort of the centerpiece of the city, but it's a very large sort of half circle shaped square. And mm-hmm. there are 10 roads that lead, 10, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the city where there's 10, it's big enough that 10 major streets can all end at Puerta del Sol. So it's literally the center of the city. Yeah. Well, Puerta del Sol is all pedestrian. And all of, the, or most at least, I, I wasn't totally sure, but I think most of the streets that lead into Puerto del Sol, each for a, a distance of four or five blocks, I mean, you know, city blocks of, of distance into the Puerto del Sol are all totally pedestrian. Yeah. So the crowds are incredible um, of people just walking everywhere, every walk of life, different things going on. The people watching is just absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah. And the, the cultural difference between sort of our car centric cities and yeah. the center of, of Madrid um, could not be more profound. Yeah. Um, and so it makes you think about, well, what are we doing here? What's our life really about? And people seem to be happy. They obviously, you know, they don't have cars nearly as much. I mean, I'm sure car ownership is still high because there are a lot of rural and suburban areas. But I thought that was really interesting. Well, you see a lot of smaller cars on the road over you do there. See, you know, you don't see this proliferation of SUVs everywhere. I didn't see any to speak of. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, and some of them are electric, but they're they're, they're beginning to adopt the electrification Um uh, the way it, it may be a little bit faster than we are. Um, I did see a couple of Teslas on the street. Um, <laughs> so that, uh, you know, they're making them in Germany now. So they're, they're getting over there. And, um, but so the, and, and just in all of the cities that we were in, we were in, uh, you know, Lisbon and Granada and Sevilla and Malaga, Malaga. Uh, it was really, you know, they all had sort of this pedestrian feel where in, in, in Barcelona, where Barcelona, you could walk, I sort of, wound my way to one end of the city and and did yeah. a, a google map okay how am i going to walk back and it was like a mile and a half and i i was able to go almost the whole way on pedestrian walkways just by you know sort of staying off the main roads and the, the cafes the you know it's really yeah, a the markets, just a cultural thing the markets the, the it's bookstores it's really just an incredible yeah you know, and, and we glory over little snippets of that that we're, I mean, you know, people complain about the Merriman Avenue road diet. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, that is such a small distance that we've gone in terms of creating a pedestrian friendly, livable kind of a, pl- uh, yeah. of a place. It's so. great to see um, the bikes, um, like going down Charlotte right now, right. you know, because they created a bike lane finally right. for, for people that, you know, live in North Asheville can now bike into downtown. Right. So I, and I think a lot of that is sort of them never having left the old ways but i did yeah. notice there were a lot of city squares where it looked like there had been you know because this city was built before there was any cars you know yeah. so where they had taken out some of the um uh, amenities for the cars and blocked them off and where they had become more pedestrian over the recent years yeah so they weren't getting more automobile oriented they were at least in the cities getting less automobile oriented and I saw a lot, of, you know, I saw a lot of renewable energy out there, you know, windmills all over the place. Uh, yeah. I took the high speed train from uh, from Malaga to Madrid. And, uh, it, you know, we were going over 200 miles an hour there for a wow. while. And the landscape just whipping by. <laughs> and, you know, you can you, you, it's really kind of an amazing you go to center city to center city. I don't know if we'll ever get that in this country, but but that was another aspect. It sure seems like a, an economic opportunity, you know, to create high speed rail between our cities and and get people out of airplanes and you know it seems like we've got the it's why can't we do that one would think one would think that we would do that but you know it does represent a, yeah. an incredible incredible investment where we have so much already invested in our highway so we'll we'll yeah, we'll but, see but I, americans I'm, I'm love to spend money right that. on projects and stuff like that so well i know we are so car centric but the future and and the urgency of climate change says we got to change that so right, right harper have you been to europe before have you got an opportunity to, to I've never been. No, I've never been to Europe before. But um, I was just thinking about uh, you know, I I don't know what I'd do without my minivan right now because there's (laughs) not really public transportation to take you know. Yeah. Well, and business and and businesses businesses um, you know, they they have their their equipment and their you know they they have businesses that do things just like what we do. Um, uh, But you're right, Harper. There's just no way in this way. You know, when you if you live out of town, how do you get to town? You know, there's no public way to do that, you know, to help people uh, move. So, you know, we are so dependent on our cars here. 
but I understand, you know, every time I drive, you know, fill up that gas tank. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah, in, in fact, with this physicist that I was talking about, the differences, and she's from the United Kingdom, she was from the United Kingdom, and, um, you know, I think uh, one of the things I've found is that in Europe, gasoline is very expensive, but booze is cheap. <laughs> so you pick your poison. <laughs> and, you know, just compare, you know, these restaurants, I mean, you can get a glass of table wine, which is really very good wine. A lot of times it's local wine for three, three, three fifty euros, which is, you know, yeah. about three eighty five or something like that in dollars and, and a beer, you know, yeah. the, 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 you don't pay like twelve thirteen dollars for a glass of wine the way it seems like we do here in Nashville when you're out at a restaurant and and people are eating out all the time people are out I, 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 an amazing cultural thing is we were in in Malaga and looking out at about at midnight out of our window and, and we could see the beach um, over there across the street and there were a bunch of kids looked like they were unchaperoned at midnight playing on the beach playing like a game of volleyball or something I mean you know these yeah. are like five seven nine year old <laughs> kids i mean like that that is different from what happens yeah. uh, you know in our in our country so i am I'm, I'm still sort of and you know of course i saw bruce springsteen in barcelona <laughs> that was quite an event i bet um, we saw a lot of the pictures Obama was there president yeah, Obama, Obama was there was well he was visit? there two days before he was there, there two days before uh, mm-hmm. we were there but he, yeah he was there and uh, and, and one of the things that about Barcelona. I mean, it was about fifty thousand people at a, the Olympics, the old Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, and I'll just contrast it to going to see Springsteen in the Greensboro Coliseum. Yeah, that in Greensboro Coliseum, you've got a very nice arena surrounded by a giant, giant parking lot that can fit everybody. In Barcelona, there was not a parking lot to be found. Yeah, and there were streams of people walking in from all directions, and other people taking Ubers or cabs yeah. or whatever to get to the to get to the event. So that it's just a Darn and man. they were not as well organized. I will say the Greensboro Coliseum had their act together better about getting people into the stadium. I must have waited in a mile long line to to get into what I thought I had prefer really good seats, but I you know it was a long line to get in. That reminds me of the um, L A Coliseum. You know, in L A is is there's no parking lot around the L A Coliseum. You know, when well, they don't have mass transit in L A. How do they when, do it? When people come to the event, well, you know, there is mass. Actually, there are electric um, trains um, okay. that that come from a lot of different directions in L A. That kind of kind of all kind of there's a hub, a bus station in in downtown L A. Which would be walking distance to the Coliseum. But you know, a lot of lo- lot of local people, you know, um, who have businesses and such, will offer their business for um, events to park. You know, for ten or fifteen bucks, twenty bucks a ticket. But there is no big parking lot to get everybody in at the Coliseum, which is, you know, that thing has been around a long time too and probably, and modeled somewhat after European right, um, right. stadiums and such. So, yeah. Well, we're so good to have you back, oh, Brad, yeah. and uh, back in the studio. And a few things have happened in America while you've been uh, gone well, on, you know, on we, the climate the news. Well, you know, the internet so. lets me keep up with the news. So. <laughs> and one of yeah. the big decisions that um, happened over the last week is um, the Supreme Court on this past Thursday um, curtailed the EPA authority to regulate certain wetlands that qualify as waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act. And this comes on the heels of the Supreme Court making a decision on emissions from um, from, from big factories and such that um, is also um, EPA is now curtailed in what they can do in, in regulating that. It turns out that um, wetlands make up about five and a half percent of the land in the continental U.S., according to the EAP, and they call it some of the most productive ecosystems in the world, comparable to rainforests and coral reefs. And along with providing habitat to various plants and microbes, they're also vital in buffering flooding and erosion, a factor growing in importance as storms become more frequent and severe amid the deepening climate crisis. And this this goes way back to, to something like 2007 when this case first came on. There was a, um, a, a family, a couple that um, actually uh, Priest Lake in Idaho, which is not too far from where I live. When I lived in Sandpoint, Idaho, it's kind of in that same area. And, and the Sacketts wanted to, to build a home that was near a ditch. That, and this ditch had water that flowed through it. 
and the ditch kind of hit to a stream, which then the stream fed to the, the um, to the yeah. Priest Lake. Right. And the EPA came, and the, so they, they wanted to flatten out the area, so they brought a lot of dirt and gravel and stuff and started to flatten out the area. And the EPA came in and said, no, you can't do that. Under the Clean Water Act, it says you can't mess with this land because it's right next to this this wetland, um, so to speak. Well, the Sacketts must have had a lot of money because they decided to take this to court and challenge that the Clean Water Act didn't apply to the home that they were building. And um, this has actually right. gone through two strains of legal decisions through lower courts into the, um, actually it was at the Supreme Court at one level and they brought it back to the lower courts. And it was the ninth district that, that, that favored um, the EPA, that the EPA had, under the Clean Water Act, had the Party. right to, to regulate this. Yeah. Um, well, it was on Thursday that the Supreme Court said, and I will say the conservative Supreme Court. Yeah, it was a five court, to four vote. Right? Yeah. Um, Kavanaugh sided with the liberals on this one, right? Right. Kavanaugh actually writes writes the dissenting opinion. What's interesting is is they all agreed that the, the Sacketts had a right to build on that land. Um, but what they didn't agree on was the reasoning as to why was the 5-4 decision, which I've never heard that before. So they unanimously were in favor of the Idaho couple, um, but not in the reasoning. And it was Samuel Alito, Justice Samuel Alito, who wrote um, who wrote the major opinion for this that said, you know, it's too broad of a definition, that this wetlands water somehow has to be connected to a body of water and we just can't go around protecting everything. It has to have a specific definition. And he said that, you know, this, this ditch here that was next to it did not meet that criteria. And, you know, Supreme Court has ruled Congress has the ability to put this right. But will they? No. You know, Congress can change the <laughs> law. Yet. Congress can change the law that says, okay, here's a better definition of, of what's protected and what's not protected. Well, I mean, the, the truth yeah. of the matter is, I mean, you know, we—, we in most places, we have water under the ground. We're all sitting on top of water right. to some degree, and those all eventually make their way into some... Well, that was the big thing with the, the Keystone Pipeline, yeah. that it was going to be running over um, large swaths of underground water and that the oil right. leaks would right. seep in. And certainly environmentalists um, are concerned about pollution and toxic waste uh, making its way into waterland without these protections. And and we were, um, we were talking at the... Um, kind of at the beginning of the show, and um, you mentioned, Harper, that that you grew up in the Outer Banks, so right here, North Carolina native, and and there's, you know, there's there's quite the wetlands. Um, Yeah, the the wetlands are really, they're just extremely vital to the Outer Banks where I grew up because there's so much flooding from hurricanes and everything. Without these wetlands, the Outer Banks could be so much more vulnerable already an extremely vulnerable place as far as climate change is concerned. But the wetlands are homes to hundreds of species of birds, and as well as there's all sorts of reptiles. I mean, I made the drive from from Asheville to the Outer Banks many times in the last last hour, hour and a half. You're just driving through swampland and wetlands. Um, There's not many people out there, but these places are very alive. And it's... um, I can't say it's surprising, but um, just to see that these, the protections for these places are going in the wrong direction. Right. Given the science and, and what we understand, you know, and, and the climate change and what's coming down the road, are these wetlands going to be protected if they're challenged or not? Or can can the EPA regulate them is, is an interesting question. Cause, well, it is. I mean, because a lot of that's privately owned property, right? I mean, it's hunting lodges and... Some of it's publicly owned, right, down there's, there? There's more than 100,000 boats that pass through these places every year. Sure. So it's a lot of you know traveling yeah. coming through. Now, it does say bodies of water. So where it gets tricky is it's where— It's like swamps. Well, where, it dry, <laughs> well, where a wetland might dry up for a while, mm-hmm. and then a little farther inland, there's more wetlands. But that yeah. wetlands is cut off from the body of water. You know, even though maybe on the surface, on the surface, surface, yeah, is what is what I think the argument is here. If you've got some wetlands, but it's not on the edge of a body of water, is that going to qualify? You know, and again, with with the Hackett's, they wanted to come in and charge something like forty thousand dollars a day until they cleaned up their mess. You know, so there was a real financial, you know, kind of um, penalty the EPA was 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 putting against this Hackett's. 
And the question is, and you know, does the law, does our government have the right, you know, to penalize somebody and make them pay that kind of money? You know, well, for violating that, the Clean Water it's Act. It's not even that question, though, because the government, I think, does have the right to do that. But they're saying that the legislation doesn't apply, doesn't, doesn't, it's too doesn't vague. give them the right to do it. Yeah. The government, through legislation, could make the changes. But if the legislation that exists, the government mm-hmm. can't sort of arbitrarily say, well, that's what this legislation means. Yeah. If the, if, if the Supreme Court says, well, no, that's not what it says. We don't believe that's what it says. I mean, that's the argument. But, um, I mean, in, in the end, it's bad for the environment, which, I mean, we should not yeah, be doing this. Yeah. We should be setting aside for nature. We These wetlands do move around a lot. I mean, from season yeah. to season, mm-hmm. some of them are, are swamps for half the year, and the other half, they're, they're a drier wetland. But just the importance they have for climate resilience is amazing yeah. because we are at all these risks for flooding and large storms, and these, these wetlands not only protect the wildlife that's out there but the communities of people that live in communities sometimes 10 20 miles away from those wetlands yeah sure i mean it seems obvious that we you know pl- we, i mean we pollution right we need to stop pollution and toxins right. from getting into our environment you know that's you, know, like you know we, we need to stop destroying the natural habitats in order to allow expansion of our, I mean, that's not even necessarily pollution. It's just destroying, it's destroying the natural habitat. That's so vital to provide services to everybody that isn't included in the, in the cost system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got time for a couple more stories, Brad. You said you kind of came in with uh, one today. This is totally different, but um, I was really amazed to read this week that um, Ford and Tesla have have developed a partnership where t- the Ford electric vehicles are going to be able to use um, all of the Tesla superchargers um, by 2025, and all new Fords in 2025 will come with dual types of plugs. So you can you'll be able to plug in a Tesla adapter or plug in the standard CCS adapter, which is gives will give Ford with that the best charging network of anybody including tesla Mm -hmm. uh you know i'm sure they're having to pay tesla for this to to what you think i would think (laughs) um but um it uh it 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 really is speeds things up right well to get forward off the ground and and well it really and it really um uh you know solves a range anxiety problem which for tesla drivers really don't have a range anxiety problem but it'll also solve it for new for new fords and uh, you know, it may also portend that, you know, you know, people realize that the Tesla has got a better charge connector with a better charge connecting experience than the other vehicles do um, because it's lighter, it's easier to manage, it, it's just a, a much more elegant, simple, technical solution. Mm-hmm. Supposedly, the other standard that's used was, has been described as a uh, charging system designed by committee. So... You know that that is it's really just a, a big move, and it's going to put pressure on the other automakers, and it may eventually lead to a rationalization of this. And I think we've talked about it this on the show before. You've got Tesla with this charging, which is really excellent and not like ninety nine percent reliable, and then everybody else with a hodgepodge of things. Yeah, so yeah. we'll we'll see. But that's I thought that was big news and and positive. A couple of things happening over in Europe right now. Um, over in the Netherlands, over 1,500 climate activists were arrested um, uh, in a demonstration um, by Extinction Rebellion. Oh. Yeah. And um, they were um, wanting to end fossil fuel subsidies. And um, they gathered on a highway and blocked it. And the, the police came and water cannoned them. Um, they, the, 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 um, the the activists said, you know, it was only within 15 minutes that they they kind of responded to this action to clear the roads, and ultimately, um, about 40 people are going to be charged, but most of them um, were just kind of arrested to get them out of the way so that the the roads could go on, and so uh, people over there are fighting, and then in Paris, um, there's a meeting um, to talk about um, plastic pollution. To continue conversations, it was about a year ago in Africa where um, nations came together under the United Nations to um, address um, what many agree um, is, um, you know, the, the 
plastic is being produced. It's 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 a material that's that's being produced more than any other material in the world at this point, and um, people are, are 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 realizing that only about nine percent of waste recycled um, from what we have now. Four hundred sixty million tons of plastic that's produced each year, and they expect that um, it will triple. Up. Yeah. It will triple by twenty. 60, but they really believe that there's things that they could do to reduce it um, by 80% by 2040 using existing technologies and making major policy changes um, that yeah. include, you know, stepping up um, reuse and recycling. Um, they say that 40% of all plastic manufactured today is for packaging. Most of it disposed within minutes of op- opening it. Globally, just 9% of plastic gets recycled. And um, both waste and production are on the ri- on the rise. Between 1950 and 2020, production of plastic, which is made from fossil fuels, increased from roughly 2 million tons annually to just over 500 million tons. And production is projected to further increase to 1 billion tons by 2050. And we're drowning in this stuff. Yeah. And, of course, you know, there, there's a lot to be said because, you know, um, a lot of it ends up in the ocean. And ends up um, one country, you know, the trash is coming out of one country and it ends up on another country's shore. So it, it truly right. is a, a world problem. Right. So people are gathering in Paris today and there's an artwork that's being unveiled um, about a five meter high um, piece of artwork that shows kind of tr- trash coming out of this machine with an oil thing. And we'll put it up on the Climate Buzz Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to be a follower of the Climate Buzz, um, just check us out on Facebook and Instagram where we keep the stuff. And they say that um, in this, um, there's a basically they're working on a treaty that a global treaty that includes more than 300 scientists, more than 140 nations, and nearly 100 leaders of multinational companies that include some of the largest plastic users. That's right, the Coca Cola Company, PepsiCo, and Unilever are coming to the table right. to see if they can solve this. Right. So, well, that's well, great news. I mean, well, you know, it's yeah, kind of both, right? Times, yeah. You know, but it's certainly part of this, right? Is we've got to Pl- figure out plastics how to address are this. the next big thing, along with climate. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break right here on the Climate Buzz and come back and talk with Harper a little more about what he does here in our community. Thank you, Bob. This is the Climate Buzz here on Asheville FM. I'm Dr. Bob, along with Brad Rouse. Kelly Sheehan's taking the day off. And um, joining us today in the, the studio is Harper Robinson, who's the owner of Conservative Pros, a group of professionals with modern and localized approach to indoor health, comfort, safety, and energy efficiency. And um, Harper, we're so happy to have you today on the Climate Buzz. And I thought we'd start with uh, just... Well, I, I what just, do you got, Brad? Well, well, just to say it's <laughs> conservation pros, not yeah. conservative pros. There may be a conservative pros out there, but it's that's okay. conservation pros. conservative? <laughs> oh, <they're> pretty much <laughs> indistinguishable <laughs> in writing. As soon as I said, I watched a little reaction over there. Like, what did I just do? I'm like, I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> like, is it this, that? Yeah. Conservation. Right. And, 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 and I will say, Harvey, I want to hear about your business, but I have, since I first came to Asheville eight years ago, heard of conservation pros as kind of the go-to people and thought of them as the go-to people for energy efficiency and green, these sort of re- renovation of your home in a green way. And, yeah. and, and, you know, they're the people that can really do the job for you. It's kind of what I so go, go tell us about it, about all of that. Harper. Well, thanks Brad. before. Tell us a little bit about you and how you kind of became interested. In, Absolutely, yeah, in conservation and energy efficiency and climate change, right? Yeah, so I kind of felt uh, climate change as as a calling for me um, to dedicate, you know, as as much as I can of my time, and uh, it started out just growing up on the Outer Banks uh, uh, from the Kill Devil Hills and Nags Head area where it's extremely vulnerable as far as climate change goes and rising sea levels. You're talking many of our roads are four to six feet above sea level. So um, when I moved to the Outer Banks, that was uh, something that my parents did because they wanted me to grow up somewhere beautiful. And when I was just learning to walk, I'd take walks on the beach with 
my mom picking up shells and seeing all sorts of, of sea creatures and wildlife yeah. that come up onto the beach there. It was my time with the Pacific Ocean growing up with my dad who lived there. That same thing, man. The ocean just blew me away, it's you know, just, like it just, just stole calls my... you. Yeah, it makes you that. want to protect it, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's something powerful to have a connection with the ocean. Yeah, and of course, you know, we'd also pick up trash as well yeah. as seashells and all of that. But as I got older, um, we moved to Nags Head and we actually lived directly uh, behind a wetland uh, of a marsh there. And... If it wasn't for that wetland, that, that house wouldn't have survived many years. Um, but, uh, you know, aside from all the all the mosquitoes and all of that that would bother us, we yes. realized, you know, how important every little ecosystem was. And uh, it's actually funny that there were certain times of the year where our house would get covered in tree frogs. I mean, just the whole house, tree frogs oh, wow. all over it. So, wow. <laughs> wildlife and nature was just something very close to me. It was something that was always around me. As I also watched many hurricanes and just the strength and the power of nature, um, I was fascinated by that. And uh, I found it kind of exciting at the time, but later realizing how, uh, how much destruction and devastation there is from these storms to the Outer Banks and just wanting to protect that. By the time I was in middle school, me and my friends would, would talk about the, the sinking island we live on <laughs> and all of that. And there turned out to be a lot more truth to that as I, as I started to understand climate yeah. change and what was going on as a result of... Yeah, I wonder how they're going to protect that area as, as the seas spend, rise, you know? They and, spend more than $100 million a year just trying to dredge up sand. Yeah. But, um, put it on the, well, put it on the beach because of both sea level rise and, and storms and, and just general erosion. The mm -hmm. beaches are what drives people there. Tourism is the big industry, right? Without the tourism, there wouldn't be the money to protect it. Yeah. But, so there's a balance between it all. So I ended up learning about appropriate technology, which is now called sustainable technology at Appalachian State University. Uh, my brother went to school there before me, and I went up there, uh, learned about, about a lot of renewable energies, as well as just general sustainable development. And just this got a lot class, or did you major in it? This or? is my major at Appalachian State. When did you decide to make that your major? Um, it just made perfect sense to me. So okay. it was funny, my brother, I actually told my brother about what he majored in, and he was like, that's right down my alley, which is graphic design. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he mentioned hit, my roommate does appropriate technology. And I looked into it. And I was like, well, that's what I want to do. Okay. <laughs> so we kind of chose each other's yeah. majors yeah. out there. Um, but I got to really hands on. I got to tinker with solar panels. And I got to um, learn about, about buildings and how we build them and how important they are. Um, how much energy we use comes from what we use at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only transportation and manufacturing and all of those things that we oh, understand. Buildings, yeah. Um, so after graduating, I, uh, which would have been, uh, 2012, um, I moved up to Asheville. I loved it up here. Uh, I should mention just how much I love love the mountains and uh, just love hiking, camping, getting outside and being in nature. When I moved up here, I had a little struggle to find a job doing uh, solar stuff. That's what I thought I was going to get into. And I had the opportunity. I have some family from the Dominican Republic. So I got to go out to the Dominican Republic and I've just kind of went there, figured out my internship while I was there and everything. Mm. I was an electrician's apprentice for a while. Um, he also did some solar installs and all of that, but it was extremely eye-opening. You know, what what I, did you see in the Dominican Republic that's, that kind of jumped out of you? Well, first thing was just that there were some really dense communities nearby, um, tourist communities just kind of outside of them and everything that were, there was just a, a extreme inequality that you could see and um uh, i found a lot of comfort in how happy everyone was there and uh the the way of life where you just just take it slow take it day by day and nobody seems to be in a hurry um it was really really refreshing but um and the community right i mean just the the great con i mean when i saw it oh, in absolutely. spain is just that 
all these people were just talking all the time, you know, and just mm-hmm. seemed to be having such a good time. And what's that all about? Why, wh- wh- oh, I had, <laughs> I had the, the time of my life out there. The, t- the community was great. Um, my brother's wife, she's, she grew up in the Dominican Republic. She's an architect. Um, and uh, I just, I, when her and my brother got together, I became part of the family. And it was just amazing to just get welcomed in like that. Uh, a lot of things like that. And, and you were there for how long? So I spent four months um, Mm -hmm. when I was there, and I'd been there three times before that. But the other things about the Dominican Republic is that, believe it or not, it is a very wealthy country, um, but you wouldn't know it by driving around there. They just export so much sugar cane, coffee beans, all of that. Um, But you wouldn't know it because of the inequality that goes on there. And the electrical grid is completely unreliable. So many people can't afford electricity that they just steal it. They just hook right up to the uh, power lines. Um, like, like cable in America. I, I, won't, I won't say his name, but the uh, when I was an apprentice under an electrician, he did a lot of... Uh, a lot of work on the weekends for free to help out um, various like mission trips and that sort of stuff that were building homes for people. And uh, I, I watched him tie that power in. It's a little different than we do it in America. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, a place like that, you know, the grid is just, it's not ready for switching to renewables, even though the resources are everywhere. Yeah. So it was, it was very eye opening. Um, were, were you noticing too um, the energy efficiency of the homes too that that are there? And well, you know, it's it's so close to the equator yeah. that you you hardly need air conditioning. So yeah. if you design your home right, you you're hardly heating or cooling. You're mostly you know heating water, uh, those other things. And they have a lot of solar, don't they? Have do they have a lot of solar water heaters where the the heaters are actually on the rooftops? And yeah, those are very very popular up right, there. Right. Right. Um, and those are cool because they're just collectors that just heat right. That well, you, because it doesn't right freeze, up. because it doesn't freeze, you can make a much simpler system than doing that same thing here, where you have to use an antifreeze to um, as the prefer, as the yeah, and, energy transfer mechanism. And the power is so expensive that it makes so much sense to do that, even right. with all the piping and panels and all that that's required to make right. one of those systems. Anyways, it was it was another beautiful place, and I, I learned more about electricity, which I I find really really fascinating. So. When I came back to Asheville from the Dominican, I decided that I was just going to look for an internship, keep working at restaurants, do that sort of thing. Um, and I was I uh, got in and I got to be an intern for Conservation Pros, where we were actually at that time doing free energy audits as a part of this uh, clean energy for us campaign that was going on. It was trying to couple solar with building efficiency. Um, and uh, my my business partner, Marcus, was the owner then, and his wife, Sarah, We were he was doing so many energy audits, he was just drowning in them. So I got to jump on a lot of those. And then I also got to do a lot of the really fun work of climbing up in hot attics and uh. digging through insulation and, uh, you know, crawl spaces, all, all those places that most people don't like to go. I um, faced all my fears <laughs> down there. I used to be terrified of spiders. but this, oh, this spiders, sort of snakes, bugs. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I've done it a few times in it. To be doing that all the time, that's impressive. So it, it's Incredible. no wonder that I didn't really know or hear much about weatherization when I was in college because solar is so much more exciting and pretty and shiny, whereas uh, weatherization is a lot more dirty work where you're, you're, yeah. um, it, it's hard work, but I actually, I do enjoy it a lot too. Right. Well, what you're saying, right, is getting into those crawl spaces and those where, where, you know, yeah, we is. have a lot of leaking, we have mm-hmm. a lot of inefficiency going on and, um, yeah. And it, a lot it, of poor workmanship down there just from right. folks who did some work down there that were just trying to get out of that crawl space <laughs> and <laughs> issues can get left for many, many years. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a problem solver. I've, I've always loved to tinker. I'm the kind of person that was taking stuff apart and putting it back together. I used to do the same with my musical instruments back in the day. I'd take mm-hmm. them apart just to, to rewire them and do all that. But um, there's so many uh, issues in buildings and there's it's so interesting in Asheville, the, the spread and when these buildings were made and uh, how buildings of different ages have really more more specific needs and that a lot of the the solutions that we develop to try to make homes more airtight by by air sealing you know we want to keep their 
heated and cooled air in that sometimes that's the focus sometimes buildings need more just insulation upgrades um, and sometimes there's just a like a broken duct that's just dumping air into a crawl space or something like that that uh that just was never never addressed or nobody ever found it so where it broke right i mean or it bro- <laughs> it, yeah or something just, chewed through some, it yeah you just <laughs> yeah something chewed through it or now when you're saying buildings are, are does, does, does conservation pros do they work with both office and and, and home and government buildings is it kind of any Kind of structure you're gonna yeah, multi-family single yeah, yeah. no apartments. We're, we're really focused on a single family <laughs> residential homes okay i'm an energy auditor and then i have another energy auditor who who works with me to provide the estimates and do the inspections and everything and i i do these analyses called an energy audit on a home where i will crawl into all of those spaces and i'll also <laughs> use some fun diagnostic sciencey kind of equipment to really find out what's going on and to be able to know for a fact where do we want to invest in reducing your energy you know where to start Mm -hmm. because we know many old homes you can go any direction with that there's so many things that you know where you're wasting energy but just trying to find where to start or what's most important or worth spending your time on um, that's what the energy audit's all about and then we have i have three crews uh wonderful i've really love everybody in my company and um, how they support our our mission of trying to reduce the effects of climate change and um, and they're just really really hard workers these these technicians that I have and they are are the ones going in those crawl spaces for sometimes we're working directly for a homeowner trying to not only reduce their energy use but make a room more comfortable um, or, you know, just reduce the draftiness overall, or sometimes uh, poor air quality indoors can be caused a lot by, by air leakage. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of, when we keep our homes closed, especially in the winter, about a third of the air that we breathe is actually coming up from that crawl space. Oh, so just by, that could be where all the dirty, icky spiders are, and that's well, what you're breathing. For, for mildew, for a lot of older homes here too, with that mm-hmm. don't have great foundations, right, to keep the moisture out. It yeah, there's a big deal for those old homes. So what it comes down to is there's just there's a lot of aspects involved in weatherization to try to not only make homes more efficient, but to make them healthier, to make them easier yeah. to live in for the people who live there. Um, and we want to continue to provide be you know yeah. who people well, go to. to well, well, it's 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 one of the right, Brad. It's it's one of the main things we can do you know, as an individual to, for in the climate thing is to, to efficiency, right? I mean, I know right. that's your wheelhouse too. Right, with, right. With just energy savers network, right? right? And, is trying and, what we and, can do and, in our homes where we live. Right, and and uh, wouldn't you agree, Harper, that the, uh, you know, you were talking about solar and that's the sexy thing, but really if you look at it, what, it, what your investment might be to make a change, that the first thing you should do is efficiency because there could be some significant gains that you would make. Um, and the cost of the cost of saving a kilowatt hour or a gallon of fuel oil or whatever it is, is a lot less to just, if you use, right. use less than if you try to come up with some kind you of- You have a running energy. tally at your website, right? Of, of what can be saved um, mm-hmm. by, by energy efficiency in our homes. That Yeah, there's mm-hmm. there's a, a counter on our website where I did a, um, a little study and looked through all of our, our previous projects and how much money, or how much money it's saving people, so the economic benefit, how much carbon we've reduced um, which turned out being the equivalent of something between 20 and 30 homes, right. kind of taking those off the grid. See, most homes are wasting between uh, 20 and 50% of their energy that they're used. So wow. if we can if we can cut back on that waste, it's huge. Uh, yes, yeah, some homes, they only have so much solar access or, so, or their roof is only so big. So they can't just convert to renewable energies. They have to start using less first. And lo and behold, a lot of these, uh, a lot of things that'll reduce your energy use are gonna make your house a little bit better too and last longer and be healthier. Um, 
there's all sorts. Of, I'd love to uh, talk a little bit about um, what's available to people to help weatherize right, their well, homes. Yeah, I mean, and, well, this new Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, it really changes the landscape for you guys, right? And and for people who might want to use your services. Is that? Absolutely. Um, and it it's slowly changing it right now, but there's a lot more. There is a low-income weatherization program that's been around for a long time, which now has gotten more funding through uh, the IRA. Um, also, it looks, if you uh, qualify, um, or if you're not sure if you qualify, you can reach out to um, community action opportunities around here. Um, they, they're taking care of the low-income weatherization for residences. Um, which includes a lot of uh, insulation and air sealing upgrades at no cost to the homeowners or the tenants. Um, in addition to that, the IRA, it came out with uh, almost a, a billion dollars, which is going to go to low to moderate income homes. So that's totally new. This can be up to $8,000 that will become available in tax rebates to people to help Im- improve their home energy efficiency through new heat pumps, new insulation upgrades, air sealing work. Um, And this is still working through legislation. So we're keeping our eyes peeled as this funding becomes available. Mm -hmm. You you haven't seen that actually in practice yet. Yeah, it it was supposed to, you know, they were supposed to figure it out towards the the end of last year, but it's looking like maybe the end of this year we might. um, And this is for anyone. It's not, you have to kind of. Well, this is a moderate income, right? It's it's income limited. So but then for totally anyone, new. there's also stuff for, for just everybody, right? The tax mm-hmm. credits, right, that we didn't have before. Yeah, and as a part of that, it's called the homes uh, rebates. And as a part of that, it's not just to those moderate. The you know low to moderate can get up to $8,000, which could be a whole energy efficiency retrofit. Mm-hmm. But also people above moderate income who don't qualify can get $4,000. And it's really cool you actually get an energy audit. The, you'll um, the energy auditor will be able to figure out how much you'll save by different improvements um, using different calculating tools and all of that and and then if you save enough if you can save 30 percent you can get a whole lot of money to um to to help improve your home and on top of that there's another million dollars going towards another um another rebate system that they're still figuring out at this point but we're just going to keep putting articles up on our website every time we learn something new. And, and, and the website's name, Harp? Uh, conservationpros.com. <laughs> just that simple, yeah. yeah. Straightforward. Well, we got to take a short break right here on the Climate Buzz, and we'll be right back. Okay. You're listening to Asheville FM at 103.3 and streamed at AshevilleFM.org. This is the Climate Buzz. I'm Bob Han, along with Kelly Sheehan and Brad Rouse. We come every Monday morning, 9 to 10 a.m. And our guest today has been Harper Robinson with the Conservation Pros, which is a group of professionals with a modern and localized approach to indoor health, comfort, safety, and energy efficiency. And... Um, Harper, we'd like to end our show with, uh, with a green tip of the day. And um, Harper, you've got one for us today. Um, yeah, that sounds fun. So uh, I would say for my green tip of the day, because it's getting a lot, it's going to be getting a lot warmer outside. It's a little chilly this morning. but um, Yeah, nice weekend, wasn't it? It's, cool uh, weather. It's a great reminder of 
uh, uh, ancient technology called night cooling, where in <laughs> places that get warmer, but they're in higher elevations, they tend to cool off a whole lot at night. Yeah. So uh, if your home heats up during the day and you can resist turning that AC on for, for a couple more hours, if you open your windows up for a few hours once the sun goes down, that's enough to cool your house down and without even needing to turn your AC on. So night cooling is a, is a fun little tip people should try out at home. And with, with, a, with, we do this too. It, and during the day, you know, if, if you have a well insulated home, you can kind of close it up. Um, and that cool air kind of stays for a while right. in, in, in the house during the day, right. you know, which was, you know, where you don't need to turn on the air conditioning um, because you're, you're kind of basking right in that, in that cool night air. Yeah, so. exactly. So op- open them up at night, close them up in the morning or once it gets chilly and yeah. keep that cool air in. We have a, yeah. we have a great house that, you know, we can open it up and, and it almost feels like, like the breeze is just moving through the home. Like we get the wind in our home, you know, that when it's cool, it, it, it's so refreshing and so nice. It's, um, I really appreciate that. We have a new build home. It's sort of now. I guess it's been about eight or nine years well, since we had it built. And yeah, you know, in, in, in Europe, they really haven't had air conditioning. A lot of places still don't have air yeah. conditioning in very, very warm places. That's how it was in Ecuador. And yeah, and it's all due to, I mean, of course, these homes that are built with this massive um, amounts of, of cement or concrete or or block or bricks or whatever they absorb the heat and they don't they're not great insulators but they have a thermal mass that you know cools off at night and stays stays more of an even temperature all around because if you look at the average temperature during the day in a lot of places it's comfortable if you could just stay at the average for the day you'd be very comfortable yeah yeah well brad it's so nice to have you back good to be back have you back here today and um hope you um adjust well or kind of get in your time zone straight um and um, it might take a little a little bit more time so <laughs> and harper thank you so much yeah. for joining us um thank on the climate so buzz and um for the good work that you're yeah and keep it up and doing uh, in our community people, and how can they get how can they get in touch with you to um they can uh, follow up and do some energy work themselves so um it's, you can reach us give us a call at 828-713-3346 that's conservation pros you can also find us on the web um, it's been a great pleasure to be here on yeah. Asheville FM today. Great. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Harper. And um, if you um, enjoy the Climate Buzz, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. I think we're about 101, 102 followers and um, love to make it 103, 104. We, we'll be um, posting um, podcasts of our shows there as well as relevant news articles that you might hear on the show. Um, I also keep an eye out for just climate in the news and post it there too. So um, one of the, the last ones I posted, Brad, was um, we said goodbye. Um, well, we said hello to the red wolves. A litter of red wolves oh, are at the Nature Center cool. right now, which is an endangered species. Um, and we said goodbye to Mitchell the cougar this mm-hmm. week, who had been um, 13 years old, which I guess is kind of old, for, old cougar, for cougars, and was having some liver problems, and he um, was uh, just a pup when he came to the WNC Nature Center um, from Oregon, where he was rescued, and um, if you've been to the Nature Center, you've, 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 you, um, you, know, you know Mitchell the Cougar, and um, I've, I've, he will I've, be missed. I've seen him out there. Yeah. So we'll be back um, next Monday. I think Kelly's back in the studio with us. We'll have a full house. And um, thank you so much for tuning in to the Climate Buzz. Thanks for listening to the Climate Buzz podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please share with your friends and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where we promise to keep you up to date with all the latest Climate Buzz. We invite you to check out Asheville FM at www.ashevillefm.org, where you can listen live, go to the Climate Buzz homepage with archives of our latest shows, as well as explore all of the wonderful Asheville FM radio programs that inspire our listeners to build connections across communities and discover new music and ideas. <laughs>